Welcome back to an all-new Second Breakfast. This is what the show is going to look like for the next, what is it, 10 years? <laughs> we did the math, basically. I think the first book is going to take us <laughs> like two years. Yeah. Like, <laughs> okay. So we're doing Game of Thrones. We are. That's, that's our next project. This is our next big fantasy series uh, for Fridays. We're going to be doing Game of Thrones. Every single Friday. Every Not single like we Friday. did in The Witcher. We did you dirty with The Witcher. I mean, it, it was necessary. <laughs> it was needed. That was every other week because those chapters... We're so long. <laughs> Some of those were two and a half hours long. But That's these, these are nice and short, short and sweet. There are just a lot of them. But I'm so excited. So let me give you some context if you've never been here. Hello. My name is Maggie. I almost <laughs> panicked and said my name was Cam because I was looking at you and I forgot who I was. I blacked out. My name is Maggie. This is Cam. We like to talk about fantasy, horror, art, fun things that we love. Anything that we like to consume and talk about. We're going to talk Art about it Art that speaks to us, we speak to you about. Yes, yes. Uh, Cam is a writer, illustrator, philosopher, thinker. I am a educator and I work in museums and art. We both studied English. We love to talk about this shit and we're just big old nerds, okay? And we both have the degrees to apply those labels. We <laughs> sure did. I'm not just making things up. We fought up. and bled for those <laughs> titles. We, we really did. So we have, we started this podcast doing Lord of the Rings. We did a full read through of The Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings series. We did a chapter by chapter analysis every week. It was a lot of fun. It took us about a year and a half. Then we moved to The Witcher series, which took a lot longer because um, <laughs> there are more books and it was more longer chapters, but that was also really really fun a totally different experience but also really really fun and as we were wrapping up the witcher we were like okay what are we going to do next because the tough thing is cam and i have really different reading preferences and things that we both like like i was all for like let's do a full brandy sandy like do do the <laughs> the the words of radiance all, all that stuff right and cam was like no and we were like is it boring to do game of thrones and we decided no it's not because it's an amazing series and we want to talk about it but also there are all sorts of things we could cover we could have done some Shakespeare or some comics or all, and we will still cover all we those will, things in an ancillary uh, right. capacity. Uh -huh. But I love that we covered these things for eras of our lives, that we yeah. have like two year chunks of each of these series. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to do that again. I like, I, I love the ritual of this. I like giving you guys an episode every Friday. And then when there are extra things we want to talk about, we have Tuesday episodes but I wanted the ritual to be able to settle into this series forever. And we both know this series. Yeah, I was gonna say. I've, I've read all of the books. Maggie's read most of the books. We've watched the show between us probably six times. Like, You've seen it more like, than I have, but we've we've seen the show. The whole thing. And we were like big, big fans when it was on. It was on when we were in undergrad and it was like perfect for us and our like, like the, the combination of our like fantasy interests and leaning into who we really were as like, fantasy nerds but also like having the intelligence to be able to follow along <laughs> with something like that it was perfect for us it was us. pretty formative at the beginning of our relationship as uh -huh. well it so was, we yeah. really do have a history with this series uh and of course we did our coverage of house of the dragon we did oh, yeah episode, we did that i totally forgot we did that <laughs> we did weekly coverage as that aired with tristan yeah our good friend tristan who's on the show sometimes who also did uh our diablo 4 coverage and diablo 3 so we, we bring him in as sort of our, our closer yeah. when we need to do our fantasy big guy, fantasy horror stuff. We, yeah. we pull him in. So maybe we'll pull him on to some of these because I be know he adores this series. Mm. I think he was into this series before I was. So he has some seniority there. <laughs> so maybe because there are so many chapters from different POVs here. I know how much he loves Jon Snow. Maybe we'll pull him in for one of those. Mm, no, that would be we got fun. all sorts of options because there are 80 chapters in this first book. So over the next 80 Fridays, <laughs> we're going to cover this whole book. It's and one then, book. And then we'll do the rest of them. We sure will. Hopefully by the end, Winds of Winter will finally be out. I hope so. And we love George here. We do. We're, we were going to call him Martin. Like I can't we called, say that. We called Tolkien, <laughs> Tolkien, and Sapkowski, Sapkowski. Uh -huh. But we, I've always called him George. Like he's our buddy, when we reference our pal. <laughs> I just feel closer to him. I'm from Rhode Island. He's from New Jersey. Mm. There's a kindred spirit mm. there. I don't know. I've been to New Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're so what we're we're gonna go through this whole series chapter by chapter. We're starting today with the prologue. It was so fun to get back into this and read it and really dig in. Um, yeah, I can't wait to talk about this. Um, if you've never been here before, we like to do quick recaps of the chapter we're reading in case you 
you know, haven't read in a while or you forgot what happened, we're just catching you up. And these are going to be brief. Cam valiantly <laughs> did these beautifully detailed uh, recaps for the Witcher chapters. And thank you so much for doing those. They were so helpful. Those were those chapters were complex and dense. They have like 40 scenes sometimes. Yeah. There's a lot to hit. We're not going to do that here. I'm no. going to give you an overview, a brief <laughs> overview. If you're confused, read the book. You're an adult. All right. Are you ready, Cam? But also because these are shorter chapters, they don't need uh, as <laughs> intricate a summary. Exactly. So yeah, it, it's... It's easier for us. It's easier for you. Mm-hmm. And thank God for George. <laughs> it's easier for everyone. <laughs> he knows how to give you a bite-sized chunk. Okay. Yes, he does. So this is the prologue of A Game of Thrones. Very exciting. We open with... Oh, I, I should also... Yeah, so we, we're going to spoil some things if you've never read these books um, because we've seen the whole show. I've read half the books. Cam's read all of them a couple times. If we're going to spoil like a big thing that goes beyond this chapter, we'll preface it. We'll let you know. But mm-hmm. otherwise... If you are totally brand new, you're going to be spoiled. You're going to get little <laughs> light spoilers. We'll try to tag the big ones. Yeah. And, and sometimes I think that might come into our discussion, right? right? Like talking about like end game things. Sure. Um, so anyway, just that's going to be part of it. Just but at so this you know. point, it's permeated the cultural zeitgeist for 10 years. I know. So, like if you, you know, don't know. Everyone knows what a red wedding is. Yeah. Like you know. congratulations for not knowing. Like that's really <laughs> impressive. Actually, you should get an award. But okay. So <laughs> this is Game of Thrones. Uh, chapter zero, <laughs> the prologue. We open with these three rangers who are from something called the Night's Watch. We obviously know what that is, but the new <laughs> Reader does not. Um, and they are tracking a band of wildlings who are apparently bad and they're in a scary cold forest. I'm not going to bother with names, by the way, not really, because this is a prologue and these characters don't return. Um, <laughs> so, one of the rangers, who his name is Will, that's easy. So, Will, um, he said that he had come across the wildlings earlier and that they were all dead. He's like reporting back. He's like, Yeah, they're all dead. We're good. And the knight who's in charge, Sir Waymore Royce, says, I don't know. Like, why would they all have died? Like, it's not cold enough for the cold to have killed him how are they all dead that doesn't make any sense so they decide to double back and check on them so they travel through the forest and they get there and they find that all the bodies are gone and it's very freaky and very fun (laughs) the knight then asks will to climb a tree and like look around and see if he can spot something and they're all kind of looking around and they've all kind of split up and then an other emerges from the woods it's just called an other with a capital o um and the other is like i mean you know it's a white walker (laughs) right it's or it's a what's the other one the white walker is like the full one but the the transformed ones are just like ice zombies it's an ice zombie okay it's a dead body that's been reanimated um and it comes out and it's yeah a white that's what it is they're not named yet here so it's all very mysterious um but it comes out and it's got this sword made of like this super super sharp translucent crystal and this other and the knight sir waymar royce uh start fighting and they fight for a while and then the knight ends up taking a blow and then his sword shatters and then some others some other others (laughs) come out of the woods and move in and kill the knight and will is watching all this in the tree it is terrified he doesn't say anything because he doesn't want to die um and so he finally climbs down from the tree and then he's like looking around trying to see if he can like uh um scavenge anything recover anything and then he finds that the knight's body like he turns around and the knight has stood up even though he's dead and is standing over him looking absolutely terrifying and then this zombie knight grabs will's throat and the chapter ends and that's it that's literally (laughs) it it's so simple and effective and exciting and it's it's very much the first scene in a horror movie yeah uh i mean we 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 covered jaws uh this this past summer Uh and it sort of reminded me of the beginning of jaws where you're setting a tone you're introducing the villain and you're showing how brutal the world can be it's it's almost like how a lot of modern horror movies almost feel like they start with a little trailer yeah uh to get you exactly like 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 a a cold open like this is this is literally uh, (laughs) it's a cold open it's characters that you're not going to see again well we i'm pretty sure we do see one of them again but we'll get to that and you don't know that at first right you don't so you think oh shit they're like you just assume the other guy's dead because he's he's gone away and like these others are very terrifying and overpowering so but at this point like this is an introduction but it's worth noting what it is an introduction to yeah because it does not show us any of our central characters Mm -mm. we don't meet danny or john or Tyrion Mm -hmm. or any of the starks or the (laughs) beloved people Uh who we followed and watched on hbo none of those people are here Mm -mm. so at, at, at once this is a lesson on the breadth of the world that it can have all these different parts and brains and people in it but also it's survivability because yeah. we so many we see so many people get nuked in these pages. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's also an inroad into the style that Martin is telling this story with. Yes. There's sort of a grim humor 
You see <laughs> these people kind of bantering. You see the misery and camaraderie of the Night's Watch. And like very grounded dialogue. Yes. Mm-hmm. You And they're almost distracted from what they're supposed to do because yes. they're kind of toying with each other. It's a little like the beginning of Reservoir Dogs, <laughs> the way the dialogue almost overrides the plot. Yeah, and it's like mise-en-scene, like you're in the middle of it. And it's not like we open on a thing and then we yes. zoom in. It's like, nope, you're in there right away. And I think that is a clue into what George is interested in Mm -hmm. in his fantasy because this is his life's work his fantasy epic he's interested in things like world building like exploring the world he's talked Mm -hmm. about his writing style and called himself a gardener where he sort of wanders through the story that's so cute and finds things i love that (laughs) that's part of why the books are so long and why character reigns supreme over something like plot I, i this is not going to be as punchy and linear as something like Lord of the Rings. Right, but But it's... Sorry, go ahead. No, no. Well, I I wanted to talk about the world building. I think it's so wonderfully balanced. Like, it's it's character heavy, but it's not like it's a literary fiction, no plot, just character. Like, there's still a lot of plot and a lot of big things happening. And there's a lot of atmosphere and a lot of, like, what you think of when you think of, you know, world building with a capital W, right? We get introduced to terms like uh, the Night's Watch and the Wall and Wildlings and who's Robert? Like, this, like, at one point, the Night's like, for Robert! And you're like, is that the king? Who's that? But, and you're sort of introduced to, what is this other? But at the same time, he's not like info dumping and not just throwing a bunch of stuff at you but he's also not holding your hand like he trusts you to pay attention and keep up but also doesn't overwhelm you and make it completely inaccessible the way that something like Brandon Sanderson kind of is and I think it's just it's wonderfully balanced between like intense character work really vivid atmosphere but also really exciting plot it just got it's got everything going for it it's accessible Mm -hmm. because you don't when i started reading this the first time i literally took notes on all the names because (laughs) i'd heard it was such a complex story Uh uh-huh and just as i had all of the names down they all die they all die (laughs) but i think that's sort of the point here is that he comes at fantasy from a more informal place where he doesn't info dump he doesn't explain all of the ground rules and then get going he just right. gets going and, and I, you pick stuff up you oof you <laughs> pick stuff up along the way in a way that has always reminded me of the way the first Star Wars movie works yeah. where you're just going in this world and excited and picking up how the world works along the way but it doesn't grind to a halt for 20 minutes because those are the 20 minutes that will lose you <laughs> right. versus the 20 minutes here that introduce the bad guy the death the sword fighting and most importantly, this is the, the my main takeaway from this chapter, mm. is his conversational characterization. Totally. Mm-hmm. And that's what I was sort of talking about before with the Tarantino comparison. In just a couple pages, we swing from humor to ethics to conflict and subtext between mm-hmm. these people. There's so much to chew on in the conversation. Yes. But in your recap... It's an action-packed chapter. Of course, yeah. I didn't get into the nitty-gritties of all the character work in there. But I mean, I mean, to be fair, this is only nine pages, but there's a lot of character work right. in those nine and pages. And as much <laughs> as there is fantastic action that looks so good on screen, oh, it does. Mm-hmm. the characterization is what is so magnetic right. when you read it. And he's taking his time giving you stuff with the characters, like talking about info dumping. I know from having read this before that we get a bit of info dumping in the, in the next few chapters, just sort of setting up the the context of the world and the geopolitical situation and stuff. But he doesn't lead with that because instead he lets you get invested in the characters and what's happening. I'm not going to pay attention to three pages of info dumping if I don't care about the characters or what's going on. And so he gets you invested in these characters who we know, like who he knows we're never going to see again. (laughs) He kills two of them at the end and presumably the third. And, but he gets you invested, gives you just a little bit of backstory about each one helps you understand the three of them, like their dynamic, their place in the world, like both like in the micro and macro sense, um, so that you are invested and that you care about what's happening. Like, even if you don't care about these characters, it's still an interesting uh, prologue because the stuff, like the plot that happens is cool. But the fact that you care about the characters makes it so much more interesting and sets the tone for how the entire rest of the series is going to go. And I really, really liked that. Yeah, it's. I, I want to transition into another thing here. And this is sort of a question for you that I have a theory on, but I want to see what you think of. <laughs> I was trying to nail down what sort of subgenre of fantasy this is. Mm-hmm. Because as we've talked about fantasy for more and more years, from all these different angles and cultures and perspectives, I think we have a more nuanced view on the breadth of this genre. Yeah. So in answering the question, what type of fantasy this is, 
I mean, I, I'm trying to look at mm-hmm. what he does as sort of a thesis statement in this opening chapter. Because mm-hmm. these are, I mean, they're five massive books. They're door stops. Mm-hmm. But the thing that hooks me as I'm, you know, knee deep in the second reading of whichever <laughs> one, it's all the things that he sold me on in these first nine pages. So yeah. I think these are really important uh parts of this story that are all laid out here Mm. he flirts with such realism Mm -hmm. and horror i sort of made that comparison already but there's such brutality in this page in these pages if if tolkien worked in a more formal way he's always talked about as the professor he lays things out he info dumps he draws you the maps he he leads you slowly through the shire before carefully opening up into the larger world And we talked about Sapkowski taking a very different approach where he was more of a journalist, Mm. where he was on the ground, tracking people's feelings and failings through all of these butterfly effects and miseries and problem of evil and philosophy and theology. He was the journalist tracking all of that. Mm. He felt like a participant, but almost begrudgingly at times as people did such horrible things in his world. I really liked how you characterized that. Sapkowski writes in a way that I have never experienced. Don't think I will ever again. So right. unique and so interesting, but that's so not what George is doing here. And yes. so so it's it's interesting to to compare these three. The posture can be so different. Mm-hmm. And they're they're all geniuses. They're all masters of yeah. the field. I love each of them individually in their own ways. <laughs> and I, I, when looking at George from that angle, by that comparison, he's not the professor, he's not the journalist. To go back to the gardener thing, maybe he's more of a wanderer, mm. exploring his own world. But I think there's kind of too much pitched action for that one to work. Right. He's more active than just a wanderer. He has much more, he has more of a role. But and, and the roles are important there because looking at even the chapter breakdowns as we were flipping through this after we made this decision, he's got much closer POVs here. Right. Not only does he follow the characters individually in their chapters, but those POVs, they're full of unspoken words, yeah, thoughts, a lot fears, of internal thoughts, mm-hmm. confessions. Mm-hmm. So then I thought maybe George is almost a co-conspirator. Ooh. Because there's such a strong focus on people's minds and what they see. He's really putting us in their perspective. Mm-hmm. That's why there's so much description of clothes and boiled leather and right. chainmail and food and bacon <laughs> grease and the crust of bread. Yes, the way that the descriptions work so well, because like, like I, I hate to just constantly compare to Brandon Sanderson, but I think that's the best comparison. He's incredibly descriptive in his writing. And it's really vivid and really interesting, but it doesn't feel the way it feels with this with George where it's like that's what your character is experiencing and so that's why you care about the color of the dress that someone is wearing or what the bacon grease tastes like <laughs> like that's why you're invested is because it's the character's specific experience of this world and so it's very cinematic in that way I am in it with the characters in a really powerful way and that's I think my favorite kind of storytelling yes but knowing the full stretch of this series I know the I know the last couple books will be a bit different from what we saw at the end of the show but I think roughly we can say we've seen where this is going I've seen the the way he tracks the lives and deaths Mm -hmm. the rises and downfalls of these characters through such sweeping operatic scales that we see across this massive world and it's that death part that really stuck with me when I was thinking about this chapter because there is such an emphasis on death whether it's about the iron that they kill people with, whether it's the cold, the burning cold, the hypothermia. He's interacting with death in in myriad ways. Characters are recalling death, almost like campfire stories when they're talking about what supposedly happened to the wildlings. (laughs) They're they're sort of sharing lore and wisdom with, with the younger recruits at the Night's Watch. They're chasing death as they're comparing stories of dead bodies and bodies are disappearing. They're confronting death as they're approaching these corpses and looking for tracks and seeing Mm. where the bodies went. There's this fear and they're fighting their own instincts confronting death. People don't want to talk about or search for dead bodies. (laughs) Right. So they're engaging with the ugliness of death even when they don't want to. And then finally, they end up questioning death when there are disappearing corpses, when we start pondering resurrection, we don't know what the hell the others are. (laughs) They could be lurking everywhere. They're kind of dead. They're kind of not. What did they do with those dead people? There's sort of a clue for something that happens to a character (laughs) later there. But there's this overwhelming focus on death. And with that underpinning, everything else in the chapter is formed. That's why the combat feels so dire. 
because death is creeping through every paragraph of this chapter. The conflict always feels dangerous. The silences throughout this beautiful landscape are so much more ominous. And this is this is sort of me building to, I want to know what you think of this here. If Sapkowski is interested in self-interest in his characters, I think Martin is much more interested in survival. Mm -hmm. So he's not the professor, he's not the gardener, he's not the journalist. I think George R. R. Martin, in his fantasy work, is the coroner. Oh, damn. <laughs> yeah, sure. Like, he shepherds them off to <laughs> off to death, or more, he unpacks and helps you understand them after they have died. It's the analysis... In the wakes of their deaths, I suppose. It's the analysis of death, the obsession with death, and the recognition of the role death plays in all of his characters' lives. It's, sure. It's that turn of nature and of human nature, this reversal to base instinct when I talked about survival right. earlier. It's it's a more visceral evocation, uh, evocation of Thomas Hobbes. We talked about Leviathan throughout the Witcher discussions. Yeah, we did. Mm. It's the cold shadow of death that hangs over everything. I caught a couple phrases in this chapter, whether it was the ghost light oh, okay. uh -huh. <laughs> that was burning within the White Walker. It's that survival instinct personified, mm. ghost mm. light. They are this shadow presence. They are the shadow of life. They are creeping death. Yes. Death made material, stalking and hunting the living. It's sort of the worst case scenario <laughs> of all of our survival instincts. Yes. Well, and I think that's become sort of the crux of the, the whole series, right? Is if we don't like get over our political strife, strifes here, we are all going to die. And so they have to like come together and focus on this larger threat, which is the death of all. And so even though like the political fighting that happens throughout the series, which is fascinating and amazing in its own way, has is full of death and is, is I mean, all struggle is about death in a sense, right? But it's it's taken a step further. It's 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 expanded more and it's more like large scope macro. And so that is what becomes the the ultimate, you know, conflict at the end is how do we come together and battle death like death itself because yeah. otherwise we will all be gone can i trust you to fight the metaphor of death with me <laughs> or am i worried you're gonna kill me too right one of the other phrases that hit me uh -huh. was cold butchery yeah and I, the way I remember that one there's mm -hmm. laughter in this chapter during mm -hmm. this this exposure of the ugliest side of us and of human nature it's drawn out but separated that sort of, that version of survival instincts, that personification of death is drawn with such artistry as the other. Yes. It's primal, mm -hmm. it's universal, it's relatable because yeah. death does come for all of us, mm. regardless of our age, class, <laughs> wisdom, seniority. That's why I think there's such a, a survey of types of men at the Night's Watch who we see here. And they're yes. all nuked just the same. Yes, it doesn't it's, matter how old they are, how much experience they have, how noble they are. Mm -hmm. like, like, I, like literally in terms of birth, noble. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. and I think that's a preview of George's attitude towards class and society yeah. as he presents this apocalyptic threat to these people. Well, and his obsession or his preoccupation with death is, of course present in the way that he, spoiler, kills a lot of his main characters <laughs> on a, in like what it, at the time was a really unexpected, subversive way. But where, where Tolkien artificially keeps people alive, and we, we <laughs> talked about armor. how that quest felt so faded yes. to the point that it felt protected and there weren't stakes. If George is acknowledging how inevitable and powerful death is as a motivator, as a factor in every decision every human being has ever made, then when people die, it's inevitable. Yeah. It's the release of the thing he was trying to hold back. Yes. It feels more natural and true than these other people who just encase characters in plot armor because they want to tell a story. Mm. And at that point, it is just a campfire story. It's <laughs> not a tale about human beings making decisions. Yes. And not spoiling anything in particular, but over the arc of these books, we see death and tragedy and mistakes and murder. <laughs> yeah. We see human nature run rampant. Right. And the underpinning of all of those tragedies and decisions and mistakes and crimes of passion, it's all death mm. and survival. Mm. So when people die here in an honest world, it makes <laughs> sense. Yes. It's yeah. just, it's a doubling down on a lot of what we've loved in Sepkowski and sort of what, what didn't work for us in parts of Tolkien 
because the, that fight for survival is so communal and it gives us such insight into all of these characters that we barely get to know. Right. And we're never going to see again. <laughs> but I feel like I understand them. And I feel like I understand the people in this world. I mean, these are a very small subset and they're from a specific, like they're, I mean, they all, they're unique and come from different places, but they still all have this one thing of being in the Night's Watch. That's something they have in common. And we know from later on that that's because they're criminals. So it's a really small subset of this world, but it still helps me understand the full scope, I think, and the way that people think about death or honor or duty or danger or survival or self-interest or any of those things and how varied that is even among these three and we never we don't we never know these men's backstories it's not like uh orange is new black where we get a, a <laughs> full we'll, episode oh we'll this get, is the tasty episode <laughs> yeah, we'll get like a, a rose tinted sort of backstory <laughs> episode about them we're never going to get that mm. but in their brief conversations we see them speak to the universal yeah to the point that we can connect with them we can feel like we understand them and that's that underpinning that George lends all of his characters even the most savage and brutal and unworthy they're still people yeah which means you have to draw them with some humanity it can be twisted and broken and whatever you want but it has some humanity and if he's viewing death as the base of all human nature Mm. then we can see a little bit of ourselves in even his most towering disgusting villains yes and that's why this story is so fascinating to us i was gonna say this is what i've always loved about this series is the complexity and humanity in every single character a lot of people especially when the show was first airing you know the criticism was oh well none of these characters are likable they're all terrible people and you're like no that's what makes it so interesting is that they are actual real people who are flawed and you see the good and bad in all of them and it's kind of up to you you know what ends up mattering more um something i noticed a a tool that george is using in this chapter um i I feel so weird calling him george but i can't i I can't (laughs) say the word martin it's hard to say mr martin Uh, mr martin um (laughs) that i'm noticing that i didn't quite know what to do with and now i think i'm understanding so throughout that there are quite a few oxymorons that stand out to me um the the one that stands out the most is nothing burns like the cold talking about cold burning like you know what that means you've experienced that but it's still it doesn't it's logically confusing at one point he also says a blue that burned like ice and there's another where he says white shadow so there's like little instances of oxymoron i at first to me read as emphasizing the otherness and unnaturalness of the others right and i think that's still true and valid like how can they burn and be cold at the same time how can it be a white shadow like they're unnatural and strange but now i'm kind of getting based on what you're saying it's more about the like the natural and innate complexity and duality in all in everybody Mm -hmm. in all people right whether they're dead or not (laughs) like talking about a villain like cersei who is terrible and evil and a total psychopath but you still care so much about her because she struggled and she has things that she cares about, mm-hmm. right? And you can say that about any character in this book um, or in these books. And so I think that, that those oxymorons being present mostly in the others, but if the others are also like carrying this metaphor about death and this thing that connects us all, I think you can extrapolate that to the 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 complexity and duality that exists in all of us as well it's these characters they are hbo characters hbo (laughs) is the best that's that's our little home for entertainment because it has the most watchable self-sabotaging broken fascinating characters that's why we love tony soprano that's right i mean i could i'm not gonna sit here and name it (laughs) yes but succession works and i think we've talked about succession a little bit sort of on and off we did a couple episodes on it a a couple months back yeah when the last season was airing yeah But Succession began as a show that I think was interested in discussing politics and political families and media families and all of these grand ideas. But the characters, because it was such an unbelievable ensemble of actors and writing for those actors, it became a a magnetic character piece Mm. where you were more interested in this family than even parsing the critique at times, which was always razor sharp and interesting, Mm -hmm. but it was the characters and the humanity and the, the ache of those broken people trying to fix things and make it work that by the time the show ended on, on what I think is more a message of critique than it is character, for me, it felt hollow. Mm. And if these books are all doorstops, these are five (laughs) massive books, I know all the big 
twists and falls <laughs> and yep. revelations, and they're all right there in character. Mm-hmm. I love yeah. that. I, love I, I that. just I think this is this is a book, but it's also. <laughs> what I love about HBO. Truly. As it's you, the mountaintop. As you've been talking, I'm thinking about your death thing. I'm going to read the first few lines of this whole series. They're like the very first lines. We should start back, Garrett urged as the woods began to grow dark around them. The wildlings are dead. Do the dead frighten you? Sir Waymore Royce asked with just the hint of a smile. Immediately making <laughs> us think about, is right. like, do the dead frighten you? And also saying the wildlings are dead, like, and talking about the forest growing dark, like winter yeah. is coming, death is coming. Does death frighten you? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also so funny that Waymore Royce, the knight, asks, "Do the dead frighten you?" And then he's one who becomes dead, and then is the scary dead person at the but end. It does make us uncomfortable because I think our logical brains, when we face contradictions or paradoxes, it, there's almost this belief that, like, if you point it out, it'll go away, uh-huh. but it doesn't. <laughs> like people, people. I, th- I feel like we do this about politicians sometimes, of like pointing out they're dumb and unqualified, and that's supposed to be like an argument. But to the right. people who believe in those politicians, they don't give a fuck. No, they don't. It's fine, <laughs> right? And I think there's some sort of that confrontation in these pages of there's a character who's dead. There are all these bodies, but now they're up and walking around. <laughs> and I know it shouldn't work, but it's still but there. It's still there. It's still a threat, and I have to deal with it, and I don't know how to deal with it. And it's this challenge mm. of what do you do when all of your rules are broken? Right. What and happens I'm, next? And I'm just excited for the next chapter, which I believe results in more like <laughs> decisions about death connected to this chapter. So like it's this is really exciting. Yeah. I'm I'm gonna like look out for that the entire way through. And like <laughs> and like playing with the the idea of death is like not a new or unique thing but the way he's doing it the way you've talked about how he's doing it i think is really special so i'm excited to look out yeah, for that i i love these books so much i want to close here on sort of just a little bit about my history with this series because it really does mean a lot to me mm. and i wrote this up just because I, I was sort of swarmed with some memories and feelings when i started reading this chapter and writing these notes and i I first discovered this series. It was so big. It was back when we had a monoculture. Back when we all watched the same fucking things we could talk about something. We all watched Game of Thrones. I'm talking like around chapter th- or, um, season, season three, three or, or four. four. Mm-hmm. And I was on... It was like 2013 Yeah, it was, it was right around yeah. there. Uh-huh. And I was on this study abroad program. Shit, it was, it was a- 10 years ago. <laughs> You're At so the time old. of recording, that was 10 years ago. <laughs> Maggie okay. just had a birthday. Um. It was a while ago now. It was a while ago. Okay, sorry. Continue. So I was I was on this Shakespeare study abroad program, and I was walking through like the streets of Oxford. That was sort of what I was doing in between Humble stuff brag. for the program. <laughs> it's relevant or I wouldn't talk I about know, it. I know, I know. I just like making fun of you every time you bring that up because it's very funny and I'm bitter that I didn't do that. Yes, I think that's the main <laughs> it's thing. It's the bitterness. We went to the same fucking school <laughs> and I didn't do this program that you did. It's fine. And okay, it was go going to all of the best you know spots and locations that are resonant to uh, studying Shakespeare and there I was also like drinking for the first time it was cider and it was all these new friends and yeah I was you know when I would get homesick I would go to the one like ornate McDonald's and have a Big Mac <laughs> away from home Ooh. but <laughs> I was I was wandering these streets and even discovering like what their little Walgreens are like yeah and they uh-huh. they always have these little sandwiches cut in half in these weird little triangular boxes and <laughs> that's what people get is their little like grab and go lunch a cheese sandwich. I was finding all of these, you know, comfortably exotic things in this country that's as close to America as you can get. But I was I was discovering this place that also occupies this mythic place in my head, in Maggie's head, yes. in every in American child heads. who loves fantasy. <laughs> yeah. Whether it is uh, Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter or any of the other mm-hmm. series we grew up with where, where really our imaginations caught fire. Yes. A lot of it has to do with England and for Maggie and I, who both, you know, went on to master's degrees and all this other shit, being homework kids, I think that a sort of dark academia thing is part of that magic for us. Totally. And this series is not about students. It's not the same as Harry Potter, but I think it has some of that underpinning. Mm. And walking through Oxford and the streetlights and the bookstores, the cobblestones, going to London, going through the country and these old ruins grass fields and meat pies with little hearts of crust (laughs) on top it was an incredible period for me Mm. and the realization of a lot of the things i loved in the books and movies and shows that i fantasized about when i was growing up it was a transformational time and this book or this audiobook narrated by roy detrice 
this was the soundtrack. This was the story of that adventure for me that really mm. broadened my mind, my experiences, my horizons, my social skill, like all of these different <laughs> things that I learned and had to grow flying internationally alone and just dealing with yeah, stuff for six weeks. Doing all that for the first time as an adult. Yeah, it was. I mean, mm-hmm. it was a, a broadening moment and unforgettable. Do you think and that's why they call it study abroad? That's very good, Maggie. Thank you. And this story <laughs> was essential to that. Yeah. Uh-huh. And that's that's what I was looking at and seeing and studying and drinking in while this audiobook was playing in the background. Mm. I know when we go through these chapters, I'm going to remember where I was mm. for certain things that were happening here. And I'm just thrilled to revisit this story with Maggie, with you, the listener, mm. and with the late, great Roy Detrice by my <laughs> side once again. So yeah. I want to close out the episode by... To myself, to you, to everyone, saying welcome back to Westeros. I love that. I love that. Yeah, if you have like read these books before and you kind of want to read along, but you're like, do I have time to read? I don't know. Listen to the audiobook. I'm not an audiobook person very much. I have a hard time like keeping up and, and whatever. That's my own problem. But I love these audiobooks because that narrator, he does such a good job. And he really lets you like drink in the story and gives it so much like energy and vivacity and uh like magic it's really really good so i I recommend that if you either have read it before and you want to do it again or if you just haven't read it at all and you yeah. like audiobooks like like check it out they're great and our recaps will give you the nuts and bolts yeah you'll have enough from yeah. those i mean we get yeah. we get all sorts of emails of people saying like i just listened to the recaps i'm not reading the book that's fine too <laughs> that's fine that's, that's fine, fine too it's ideas we yeah get there. yeah yeah and and if there's specifics we'll mention them when we're talking about our analysis and yeah. if you're confused just go read the chapter you know you can do it so yeah <laughs> that was the first episode talking about game of thrones i'm really excited 79 to weeks going. to go oh my god <laughs> but i'm so excited like i i loved the witcher it was great i loved tolkien it was great but I've got a different level of excitement for this one, and I'm thrilled. Yes, me too. I'm, I'm very just thinking excited. back to like Two Towers <laughs> and how much of a slog that became at one point. It got really good, but there are moments in Two Towers where I was like, "This is well, this is rough times." But th- I don't think we're gonna have that with this one. The thing I'm hoping for here is what I did get out of The Witcher that I didn't get out of Tolkien, mm. which was surprise. Yeah. And depth and things I never imagined this genre could touch. Yeah. I'm excited to find those things and stumble across them. Even though you've read it all before? Yes. It's mm. different reading it like yeah. this. And I, I only got about halfway through Storm of Swords before I gave up. Not because the books were bad. It was like I you was in, busy. I was an undergrad and didn't know how to manage my time. Like I just didn't finish them. And then things kept happening. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah. um so I'm excited to like I'm going to meet all kinds of new things and learn all kinds of new stuff, but it's going to be brand new for me. So try not to spoil anything from the later books if you can. I'll do my best. I'm saying that to you and to the listener. And to HBO. (laughs) So this is every Friday. We're going to be doing these now. When we want to talk about any other work of art, whether it's horror movies or comics or art or songs or whatever else, that'll be on Tuesdays if we have time. But the priority going forward, we're going back to basics, Mm -hmm. Fantasy Fridays. And if you want more episodes, if you want our back catalog of bonus episodes, we've logged over... I don't know, a year and a half of those by this point. We also have an exclusive episode for you every month talking about some work of art that caught our interest. Those are all available on our Patreon, $2 a month. You can get the new ones and the whole back catalog. Yes, yes. Thank you to our Patreon or our patrons. I hate when people say my Patreons. I'm like, (laughs) do you know what this even... What's a patron? Look it up. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Thank you to our patrons. You're the best. <laughs> and yes, uh, we love you if you join and we love you if you don't join. You can email us at secondbreakfastpod at gmail.com. Always, yeah. You can find us on Instagram at secondbreakfastpod. Um, and you can, it, I, th- I think our TikTok is still out there swimming, <laughs> but we have abandoned it because that app scared the shit out of me <laughs> and I have not returned. So maybe we're who, good. Maybe we're like blowing up over there. We'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for being here, everybody. And have we'll a good. Yeah, we'll talk to you soon. Have a good weekend. And, uh, don't go outside in the cold. That's that's there the takeaway. Don't go outside. Don't go outside. <laughs> we should put that on merch. I think so too. Bye. All right. Bye.